clean the front eyes but just to get it a slightly different Welcome to Strange Familiars. If you have a story you'd like to share with us, something paranormal you experienced, you can email us strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com. How are you tonight, Allison? Cold. <laughs> Quite honestly, I'm just cold. Which is funny since it's January. You know what my father would say to me, no matter what time of year it was, whenever I said I was cold? Shut up. <laughs> good, good guess. Good, good, very good guess. Let's see, what are you going to do when winter gets here? I found it very confusing as a kid. Because like, it's like if it, it was, was winter in, in the middle of winter. I'm like, what? What does he mean by that? But that's what he would, wrote. Answer, no matter what. I think it means something along the lines of, "Don't complain." That's the subtext there. And you know what my mom would say? What? <laughs> no matter what, no matter what time of year. And I didn't even have to say I was cold. Yeah. This this was all based on her body temperature. Mm-hmm. She'd say, I'm cold. Put a sweater on. And that one always, like, blew my mind. Like, I'm cold. Put a sweater on. <laughs> like, just, like you're going to just raise the ambient temperature by if everyone wears sweaters. I, I guess. I don't know. I think she's right, by the way. I am cold. Put a sweater on. <laughs> Tonight, I will be talking to my friend Tara who I've known since the beginning of the internet, or thereabouts, I don't know, a long time. I've known Tara a very long time. We have made music together in the past. We're working on a book project for the future. She comes from the same circles as uh, as we do, how we met, and uh, I believe the the woman who runs Sloom as well. We were all uh, punk rock pen pals in the end back of the pen in the day. World, yeah. Before we talk to Tara, I want to thank our patrons. Thank you so much for all you do. We could not do Strange Familiars without you guys. Strange Familiars exists because of our patrons. Thank you so much. If you want to help us make Strange Familiars, if you'd like the content we make and you want more of that content, you can become a patron at Patreon. It's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. There's monthly options, there's yearly options, and there's all different kinds of tiers of support there. You get extra content, or you can go in at higher levels for things like t-shirts, stickers, pins, and more. Again, you can check it out, patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. If you don't like the idea of a subscription like Patreon, you can go to the show notes under any episode and look for a paypal.me link. If you click that link, you can make a one-time donation. Everyone can help by sharing the show on social media, by liking and subscribing wherever you listen, no matter what podcatcher you use to listen to podcasts, or YouTube. Make sure to like and subscribe, and leave us those nice five-star reviews, which helps get Strange Familiars in front of new potential listeners. All right, so let's get to my conversation with Tara. It's so funny. She knows what I do, and I told her this during the interview. And only recently, she's come out and said, you know, I've seen some really weird stuff, and starts telling me these stories. And I'm kind of like, you know what I do, Tara. Like, you know what I do. Why didn't you tell me this stuff before? But we started off the conversation of, is about music and books, obviously, because we, we share a lot of that in common. Then we go over her strange experiences, like something like a vampire, or, or what may have been a vampire, some warnings she received in dreams, dreams of dead relatives, and then she tells the story of being in West Virginia, sleeping in a van, and something slapping the side of the van. I'm not saying it was his Bigfoot. You are saying it's Bigfoot. But it was Bigfoot. <laughs> he does have a summer house in Virgin- West Virginia, so it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Since we recorded this, Tara started her own podcast. It's available on YouTube, and it's also on Red Circle. It's called Stuff and Things. Check it out. I'll put links to her music, I'll put links to her books, and I'll put links to Stuff and Things in the show notes. Make sure to like and subscribe to her on YouTube, too. She's trying to build up her subscribers. All right, so let's go ahead and hear my interview with Tara. Tonight we're talking with 
Tara Van Flower, who is my friend for, what, 300 years? Something like that. Yeah, since the beginning of the internet, I think. (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) And as these things go, very recently, Tara, I guess you just started listening to the podcast somewhat recently. And you're like, hey, I had some weird stuff happen. And of course, I've... I throw my hands up and I say, you, you know what I do for a living, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, well, it's like you don't really think about, I mean, I don't really think about things being weird. And then when you start like hearing stories of other people and you're like, oh, yeah, something like that happened to me, too. And then you're like, oh, maybe it's, it is weird. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's weird. But like we were saying before I hit record, I think everybody or almost everybody has something weird it's just whether they want to talk about it or recognize it right yeah i mean i that has to be true you at some point were like this stuff kind of freaks me out a little bit thinking about it and talking about it well there's certain things that i don't think a whole lot about because if i do it sort of weirds me out and i don't want to call things to me sort of so yeah, I guess that's kind of how it is. Yeah, I mean, like, so I don't think talking about it calls it in necessarily. At least, you know, I talk about it every week, so. Right. I don't think that that happens, but I understand your want for caution. Yeah, because, like, especially the stuff I kind of went through as a late teenager, early adult, was pretty scary, so... I mean, to me it was. So I'm like, I don't like talking about those people a whole lot because I'm like, what if it draws them back? Mm -hmm. You know, I just will leave their names out of it. (laughs) Yeah, oh, sure. Well, before we get into the spooky stuff, I I don't know, maybe it's all spooky. We can talk about your spooky books. Oh, okay. You've written like 10, 10 million books. Yeah, I kind of, I'm a horrible creator because I just release things and don't think about them much. Like, I don't add them up. Like, some people will say, like, name your whole disc- discography and they can do it. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> That's what uh, people will ask me, A, like, what album is this song on? And I oh, can, God. I'm about 60 to 70% I can answer that. But, Worse than that is, what episode was this person on? And um, it's it's no offense to that person. It's just, I right. do an episode every week, and they just blend together after a while. We do, you know, I'm over 200 now, and i just like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and, and I always feel bad because, like, Mike, his brain is like an encyclopedia. He can call back dates and song titles and this and that, and I'll be like, well, I can tell you all the lyrics. I just don't know the name of the song. Right. And so that it's, I'm just that person. I don't know. I lose track of things because it's kind of like once I finish something, I'm on to the next thing. And so I don't spend a whole lot of time categorizing things and cataloging them. And I don't know. Right. Just, my brain doesn't work that way. So you have this series of books. I do. That you started writing. What year was that? 2012 earlier 2004 actually no what really was it that long ago it was it was a long time well i I was writing it i think i was writing violent violet when you and i started talking okay so it was a long time ago okay wow okay so i don't feel quite as bad you're not hammering out like three books a year uh i kind of am now but back then it was like I wrote that book and then didn't really do anything for a while. So um, I write more now than I did then. Mm-hmm. Tell people, basically, I'll let you describe basically what it's Give about. some weird internet thing. What is a weird internet? Are you cutting out? I'm I... cutting. I'm not hearing you right now. Okay. How about now? You're back. Yes, I'm back. Like literally our internet went down and that has not happened in like forever. It's the power of strange familiars. I'm telling you, it's like something just wants to shut me up. Probably a lot of people <laughs> want to shut me up, but you know. Well, I think I think our listeners might be interested in your book, so I'm, I'll let you describe the series. Okay. 
and uh, I'm I'm only on book one, so there's I know there's like is there ten? Uh, something like that. There's a lot of them, and they're all interconnected. So even stories that don't seem related, at some point they are. That somebody will show up in the story that we already know. So basically. I hate summarizing this stuff because it seems difficult to summarize, but um, plus I hate talking about myself, which is weird. But anyways, um, yeah, you're, I you're not started a great... writing the you're... first one based off a dream that I had one night. And I was telling Mike about the dream because it was so completely detailed. Like it was like watching a movie. And I just decided that... Um, I would just write it instead, and so it became this whole world, and now the world is pretty massive, characters all over the place, and alternate dimensions, and um, all kinds of stuff, but the, in the beginning, it's just a really kind of simple story about a girl and her friends who meet a dude that kills vampires. That's the basic premise of the first book, and of course, it expands, and gets bigger as it goes and you've built a whole world now yeah and it's like multiple kind of worlds you did a graphic novel too right uh i did for one of the characters Ilya. um i did that with daniel sarah excellent artist yeah he's he's really cool um he approached me like years ago when i was actually writing violent violet and I think he approached me because he wanted to do some artwork for Lycia, and we didn't really have a need at the time, so I was like, hey, we should do this, you know, we should do something together, and so we collaborated on this a story and his art, so it's pretty cool. Nice. And maybe a little bit early to announce that uh, we're working on something together, uh, book-wise? I don't think so. I think it's not that early because we already have <laughs> one story down and the other one I just need to sort of finish up. Yeah. So, yeah, Tara and I are working on a book of fiction together, which will be illustrated as well. Look for that sometime. I can't promise people any any uh, specific dates on that. but uh... I know, and especially since I'm not entirely sure like how many stories it's going to be, how long it's going to be. We haven't really hammered all that out. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. We'll see. I'm yeah. I'm excited. I think I think that you know sort of uh crosses the worlds of the paranormal that we talk about here on Strange Familiars and horror fiction and so forth and kind of I think everybody would be very interested in that when it comes out. Yeah, it's so far I like it. it's kind of um spooky little almost poetic story so far. Yeah. Yeah, a kind of folk horror vibe, I guess. Yeah having fun writing it because it's, it's, it's sort of a different style too so it's kind of fun writing in sort of a different voice I guess mm -hmm. yeah yeah well short stories to me again I don't write fiction it's something I have a block with Tara's sort of including me <laughs> in the writing aspect of it but so far at least on the first two stories you've done far more writing than I have but it is uh it's a different thing for me. I'm I'm excited for people to read it, for sure. Yeah, it's different for me, too, because I'm used to being able to tell, like, a whole story. And when you're writing short stories, like, you have to leave a lot of the detail out that I'm used to going into. So I don't, like, I've always wanted to do comics, too, but I don't think I can do them because I need more words than comics give me. Yeah. Yeah, comics are, are hard because... On the art side, I kind of do that with the art where I want to, like, illustrate every movement. You know, like, so if, if somebody's in a fight, right. I want to show the whole motion of the punch instead of just, you know, the connecting. There's, yeah. a, real, there's a real art to it uh, that that uh, people develop over time, I think. But, you know, it takes some time. That's why people are constantly asking me, when are you going to do a graphic novel? It's like, well, when I do something I like. Yeah. I've started and left unfinished, you know, probably 10 of them at this point. So we'll see someday. Yeah, it's aggravating because, like, there's so many, as creative people, I guess, there's so many different things you want to do. And it's like, okay, I only have X amount of time. And some of it involves, like, learning curve and all that kind of stuff. And so you end up just kind of focusing on what you know you're 
good at, I guess. Yeah. So, music. You brought up Lucia. Yes. That's uh, your main band, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have anything currently officially going on right now. Just kind of recording a few songs, and I don't think I'm allowed to talk about what's happening <laughs> with that. <laughs> um, but there, there is there's activity going on, but not probably officially for a while. Mm -hmm. And we're doing some um, sort of live stuff. We've done a couple recorded live performances, and we're supposed to do another one, I believe, in May. Someone in Phoenix is organized in an online sort of Phoenix festival, and we're supposed to do a couple things for that. But other than that, we haven't got much going on. And of course, we sort of want to play live shows, but, you know, everything's shut down now anyway, so it's kind of irre irrelevant at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do the live streaming virtual concert things. Yeah, we've got a bunch of friends that do it, like, on Facebook Live and stuff like that, but I don't know. I'm always, like, paranoid about the technical stuff and... Right, that, that's the thing, like, I just, it's the same thing when I play live concerts, you know, back when people could actually go to clubs and right. stuff. I don't want to think about mics or mixes or, right. or any of that. I, I want to perform. I want to just concentrate on my performance. I don't want to have to set up sound systems and tell people, you know, this and that. That I think that's one of the reasons why I went to performing acoustic because it's just be like, just give me a microphone, give me a microphone, <laughs> and, and and that's all I need. Just give me a microphone, maybe put some reverb on it. I'll, I'm fine. That's kind of like where we're at at this point because back when we toured, like in the '90s, everything was electronic and. At that time, when we would show up places, like a lot of times they didn't even understand how to do our sound in mm -hmm. these places. And mm -hmm. so there was tons of problems and feedback and like, you know, if your DAT player wasn't working that night, then you were pretty <laughs> screwed. And so now we basically just, we've been sitting around just playing acoustic guitar and singing to it for like a couple years now, just kind of around the house for fun. And... That's kind of where we are at now, too, where it's like you don't even want to have to deal with all that stuff, like having everything programmed. And if one one little piece of it goes down, then the whole show is like basically screwed. Yeah. Where it's just your voice and a guitar. It's kind of hard to screw that up technically, mm -hmm. although you're way more vulnerable on your performance. There's like nothing to hide behind Absolutely. <laughs> your performance. So, you know, it's kind of it's kind of weird in that regard. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a, definitely a trade off in that aspect. Before, I'll just make sure to bring the smoke machine, so at least there's smoke machine to hide behind. <laughs> Before Prevwin moved to the UK, we had actually we were working on a live set that was just going to be one mic like the blue the old bluegrass bands used to yeah. do you step up to it you play when it's your, you know you're doing a solo you step up to the mic you step back when you when you're not and everybody sings together and just to avoid the cuz we had such problems you know especially you go into some of these clubs and they've never even dealt with a band that's all acoustic exactly. before and they're just like what what we well where do you plug in i'm like yeah i don't plug in <laughs> you exactly. You put a microphone here, and then that's what you do. And they're like, huh? I'm, you know. And when we had, like, five people all playing acoustically, that was just a mess. Because a, oh a, a lot of people were just like, we don't have enough mics for you, you know. So. Yeah. They never understand. <laughs> <laughs> and we even started doing, like, we would bring our own direct boxes and, like, all this stuff. Because... I don't know, I guess in the 90s, if you weren't like a, a standard rock band, mm -hmm. and like with Mike's guitar being so heavily affected and everything, and then you had keyboard and all this stuff, like they couldn't tell the difference between the keyboard and the guitar, and like the mix was always wrong, and the the feedback would be insane, and just it wasn't worth it anymore to... Because yeah. you never gave the performance that, that you gave at home 
where you had the controlled environment. And so you were just uh, like, for us, we just constantly felt like we're disappointing everybody. Like we're not giving you what we wanted to give to you. And even if like the crowd sort of didn't know that because they don't know what you're supposed to sound like. Right. It was always this like feeling of God, we suck today. Like, you know, it's just always this letdown, like very few shows did we play where we're like, that was good, you know? Mm -hmm. So, with the acoustic stuff, I think it's better because you have more control over it. And, and like, even then, sometimes it's like, I'd almost rather have no amplification at all. Like, we'll come over to your house, sit on your living room floor, and play a couple songs for you, and then head on back out. Because uh, I think it sounds better, weirdly uh, enough. Those, they're my favorite shows to play. Yeah, it just sounds better, and it's more organic, and, like, you feel more in tune with, I guess, what's going on. Yeah, we, we were playing a, a club in Baltimore in the, the, the last iteration of Stone Breath, and they kept having, like, feedback problems because, you know, again, it's all acoustic instruments right. and stuff. And there weren't that many people there. There were only, like, 15, 20 people there at the most. Yeah. And I just stopped. And I told the sound man, I was like, stop it. Just turn the sound off. And I told everybody, just come up to the stage. Everybody come yeah. here. Sit around the stage. And we're just going to... And the sound man kind of got upset. But I'm like, the, I'm, the feedback's horrible. Like, we don't need it. Right. We're just You're gonna... wrecking the show. Yeah. Yeah. And it worked great. Because there was only 20 people there. They could all hear. It was just... We just played 100% acoustic. Well, and when we went to Mexico City in the mid-90s, it was us, uh, Love Spirals Downwards, Arcanta. I think, I feel really bad if I'm forgetting anybody, but I think it was just us three. And, you know, we were in this club and, like, the electrical was all wired crazy and and the, the electricity actually went down at one point. And Lycia being 100% electric, like, there was nothing we could do. Mm -hmm. And Los Spirals Downwards went up there, and they had an acoustic guitar, and they had Suzanne's voice, and they, they could still perform. Thankfully, the electricity did go on after the fact, but it's like, all these people came to see us, for, you know, flying from Ohio to Mexico City, and, like, you get there, and the electricity's down, and we're stuck. Hmm. And so, if just the idea of being able to perform anyway regardless is appealing for sure yeah yeah i mean i, mean, I just I, just a, a small intimate show anymore i, I just really enjoy it it's, it's i think yeah it's, i think the audience enjoys it more they connect with you more and uh the, the, there's zero sound issues which is always fun yeah for sure like who needs all that garbage i should have looked at you know i can't even tell you what year we did black happy day Oh God! Um, like 2005, maybe. Maybe <laughs> I should have looked before we we started Something the interview. Like that. This is the, again. This is one of those questions, like we were talking about, when people say, <laughs> "When did you do this?" I I don't know. I don't know. I, at some point in my life, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Could so have been 18. Could have been 30. I don't know. Someplace in there. We did a record together uh, under the band name of Black Happy Day. Yes, and uh, it's it's one of my favorites. I can't often play it on the podcast. We're gonna try tonight because hopefully that's gonna change. Yeah, hopefully that's changed. Uh, it, was, it was just tied up in weird internet legalities, right? <laughs> things, yeah. So hopefully it's clear now, and we're gonna try to close with one of the songs from Black Happy Day. That'll be cool. But. Uh, I always feel sad about that release because it, I love it so much. And, like, the people that I think should love it also, I don't think know about it. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like it was, the ball was dropped so hardcore on that album, and it's not fair. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I mean, especially listening to it. I listened to it, uh, you know, a couple of nights ago. Yeah. After not having listened to it in a while. And uh, it's mixed really well i mean there any you album you it. listen to in the past you go ah, i want to change that that and that but uh listening to it I was like wow this is really mixed well and it, it's you know it's of the time it's it's it is what it is but for sure i'm you know i, I listen to it i'm like wow there's some really like good stuff here it's such a weird album it is it is <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, and I, I, I feel like we recorded, like we were talking a little bit the other day, like Frankenstein, like it's such bits and pieces like weirdly sewn together through different equipment that neither, like none of it seems compatible. Yeah, I don't know how we did it. We, we've never had recording equipment that's compatible. Mm -mm. You said we were trading yeah. CDs back and forth. Okay, that, we I mean, must have been the case. <laughs> But I know for a fact some of it I recorded on four track cassette because I re yeah. I remember mixing it and tweaking the the speed on some of the stuff which is you know you can do at least on the four track I had you could do pretty easily it's much harder to do that it's just a dial on a four on my old four track but much harder to do that digitally so I remember specifically like do, doing that and then mixing it um, it was a four track recorder with like a like a twelve track mixing board so you could actually mix in other stuff even if it, they weren't on different tracks pretty crazy piece of equipment but i remember using that uh for yeah. when we did it so it's just this like how did we do that like because you didn't have a you weren't using a four track no i was using acid and um in more ways than one no i'm just kidding <laughs> but, um, <laughs> no but um i totally remember getting cds in the mail from you mm -hmm. popping them into the computer and like whatever you had there was kind of done and so I would add my stuff to it and then I, when I initiated a song then I would send it to you and then whatever I had was done because you couldn't do anything to it so right. it was like it, it it's a good thing that we trusted each other's taste because or maybe we did I don't know you might have said like god what does she do but no no I, I love it I love it <laughs> Yeah, it just it worked out really well. It's just funny because, like, you know, it really was sort of for Frankenstein monster in a good way. Yeah. yeah. Frankenstein monster isn't a good thing anyways, but anyway. Someday I will twist your arm into doing another Black Happy Day. Um, I know, and, and I, I haven't done music in so long at this point. I will have to, like, relearn how to record so that's one of the reasons, like, I kind of don't, because our studio is, like, a, is non-existent at this point, so, like, I don't even know how Mike accomplishes anything on our setup, but, um, at some point, for sure, I want to at least do a couple tracks, you know? Yeah. For well, sure. I have selected the one that, uh, yeah. that we must do. So at some point before, before we die, we have to record that song. <laughs> It'll happen. <laughs> It'll happen. Yeah, you, well, you did a couple, um, like, solo things recently, right? Just almost acapella, right? Just... Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't I don't know why. I just, I don't really count that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess because I don't put, like, a ton of brain power into it or something. I don't know. I did a couple songs for a Cure tribute that happened in Italy, I think that's all I've done recently. I've done some guest vocals on a couple different bands, things, but I kind of, like, am not doing that anymore. For one, because the recording setup is wonky, but for another, it just becomes this sort of weird thing of... I constantly get requests and stuff, and then I, like, I can't do everything, and then I feel bad about it, so... Mm -hmm. I'm just like, I'm just not doing anything at all anymore. That way I, can't, I don't have to feel guilty for not doing everything for everybody. Right, yeah. Because I'm that, I just, I feel like I owe everybody everything. So if I say no to everything, then I don't have to feel bad about saying no to anything. Right, you just make a blanket rule. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So it would have to be like pre something pretty like monumental i guess to pull me out of retirement at this point that sounds so arrogant that's not what i how i meant it but it, it would have to be like black happy day yeah and lycia like those are my two things that i do now and that's pretty much it all right I'm, I, if i'm included if black happy day is included well in that, i mean I'm, I'm but black happy day also is my band so right, that kind of makes sense right true that's not like i'm not doing guest vocals for you it's our band. Right, exactly. So it's, that doesn't really count as, like, guest vocals. I think an album every 20 years is a good goal, though. I mean, yeah. Right? That would be kind of cool. Like, <laughs> If we could figure out what year yeah. the other one was. 
<laughs> sometime in the past. I, it's it's in. I think I have the year right on the Bandcamp. It's on the Stembreath Bandcamp. Yeah. I think the year's right. I think the release date. I had no clue. I usually just put Halloween. I get the oh, yeah. get the year date and then just put the release with Halloween. I have year. no clue on anything about. I, I I'm horrible. I can't remember a date to save my life. Yeah. And and once you do a bunch of stuff, it's just like yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's completely true. And like, I I just I don't care about arbitrary stuff like that. Anyways, I don't know. Like with my books and stuff, like how many books have you written? I don't know. I just write them and they're there. I don't. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. I'm not. I'm not like not trying to tally up how many points I scored. I don't know. Yeah. They're there. And I I start I interrupted you when we started talking about the books before I was gonna say you, you're no offense you're you're not a great self promoter. I'm no I'm I will one hundred percent own that I am horrible at yeah. self promoting. I'm really terrible. I can hype you all day every day. I cannot hype myself to save my own life. <laughs> That's why I can't even do book descriptions. It's just like, uh, it's a book about some stuff and like some things happen and like there's vampires, but that's not like the main focus of the book, but they're there and things happen. It's I'm awful at it. Yeah. You you need a, a <laughs> literary agent or something. I need I need like a flavor flave. I think that's what I need, a flavor flave to there just you hype go. me off. Hype man. <laughs> He might be available. <laughs> I think you have to live in the house with him, though, right? The... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. I'd be all right. I don't know. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, we will circle back to the music, perhaps. But uh, I want to talk to you about... So you sent me a list of I did. this like weird stuff. And again... All these years, and I'm sure we talked about it at some point, but I wasn't doing the podcast probably when we talked about it. So it's the kind of thing where it just kind of blended in with this, you know. Normal conversation. Yeah, years of conversations we've had. So to see it all in a list again, when I was like, hey, just tell me what, tell me all the stuff because I want to talk to you. And you put a list, I was like, wow, these, there's actually, there's some interesting stuff here. Yeah, I don't, and it's like one of those things where, like, you don't think about it. It's just your life, right? right? And you don't really think anything is odd. And I still don't really think it's odd necessarily or what some of the stuff even is. So mm -hmm. I guess listening to your podcast and stuff and then having conversations about it, it's like, oh, that happened to that person and that happened to me too. Right. And then you start thinking, well, maybe it is a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that is a uh, ongoing drumbeat of the podcast. Where, you know, people are just like, what? Yeah. And, you know, and as, like, the stuff that sort of happened as a kid even, you're just like, okay, well, people tell you you're a kid and you have an active imagination, and that didn't really happen. Right. You know, so you're like, okay, well, I guess it didn't really happen, and I have an active imagination, you know? And it's not like it was things that were so outlandish that you couldn't theoretically explain it. Mm-hmm. But... I guess you put enough things together and you go, okay, well, maybe that is weird. I don't know. Yeah, so I, some of the stuff you have is pretty weird. So <laughs> really? Okay. I mean, well, like, you know, Strange Familiar is weird. Not like, you yeah, know, yeah, no, yeah. nothing I haven't heard similar stuff about, but it's, you know, it's, right. it's Strange Familiar is worthy. Yeah. Well, all I know is that my entire life I've been, like, a scared of the dark person. Mm -hmm. And... There has to be a reason. You're just not scared of the dark for no reason. Do you sleep so, with the light on? I don't anymore, but I absolutely did from about, I want to say, age 18 until I met Mike at 23. Wow. For reasons that I explained earlier of, like, I don't want to say their names, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, kind of stuff. So, so, yeah, I slept with the lights on for a long time. Allison still Wait. sleeps with the light on. Still, still. Reasonable. Yeah, I get yeah. it. Yeah. Like when Mike and I met, he was like, "Aren't you going to turn the lights off?" And I'm like, "No, <laughs> I'm not." So yeah, I don't know, but I do now. But mm. I still have to have like our window. This is weird, quirky maybe, but um, like I sleep right beside the window, and I always have to have the blinds up 
because I have to be able to see out. Like, most people want to hide from the monster, but I'm like, no, I need to see him if he's there. Oh, wow. Yes. For me, as soon as it's dark, shades come down. That's funny. Like, I want to see what's out there. If something's looking in the window, I need to know that it's there. Yeah, I don't know what that is about me. I just, I can't. Well, I think you're normal. I think that's <laughs> how most people operate. Well, most well, actually, people hide in the dark. A big part of it is, so if, if somebody's two feet away looking in, you can't see them. It's the only time you see them is when they get right up on the window. So mm. I'm always worried somebody's, you know, out there in the dark looking in and I, I can't see them. Not that I'd be happy to see them either. but uh, <laughs> Right. Either way, it's kind of gross. <laughs> the stories about Bigfoot looking in people's windows and, and the tents and stuff, those to me, I don't want to see that. I'll, like, let me see them walking through the woods, but I don't want to look over one night and just have them like staring in the window at me. Yeah, that's too close for comfort. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, let's let's talk some some weirdness. Okay. So, I'm just gonna I'm just looking at your list. We'll just go by the list. Sure. So we talk about like you know dreams as a kid, dreams about the apocalypse. I wonder if that was something to do with when we grew up. It's possible, and and because I think about this a lot, so. Like, I, because I try to figure out what possibly influenced it. Because I was probably, the dream that I'm, that specifically I remember, I was probably only about four or five years old. And my family went to church when I was a baby. And we quit going, like, around age two. Like, I was around age two. So, theoretically, I'm sure I heard stories in this church. So, they were probably embedded there someplace. But other than that, I would have not heard really. It's not like my family sat around talking about, you know, the coming end of the world or anything like that. Right. But this particular dream that I can still see in my head, in the dream I woke up and the world was like completely silent. Like there was no sounds except for I could hear this trumpet. So in the dream, I'm like, okay, where's my mom and where's my dad? And I'm looking for him. And this trumpet is just like blaring. And I walk outside and it's literally like a cartoon cloud with like a cl- a cartoon like horn <laughs> sticking out of it. And I'm like, and, and this voice said, don't worry, they'll come back for you later. Oh, wow. And so a- apocalyptic weirdness I guess I don't know what that is but it's weird but that's not like I've heard that voice in other dreams as well where this voice is like telling me something like to just don't worry things will be cool interesting yeah it's weird like it's happened to me a few times actually Yes. Yeah, so when you said, so, you know I'm just looking at the list and when I read dreams about the apocalypse I was thinking like so when I was in elementary school because, I don't know if you remember, uh, The Day After. Uh, that, yes, that, horrified by that. That movie that came on. And there's just all this talk of, like, you know, mutually assured destruction and, yes. and all that. So I would regularly have, you know, sort of apocalypse dreams back then. But if you're saying you were, like, five or something, that's, that seems early for that. Well, and it was very, like, I mean, everybody was gone and it was, like, cartoonish. I mean, cart- I can see the stupid trumpet in my head. It was like those um, cartoons from like the 60s and 70s, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. just, I don't know, just weird. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I've always had just kind of weird dreams. Well, not not all of the dreams aren't weird, but like, you know how certain dreams just feel different? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Kind of like that, I guess. So the vampire in your room. Yeah. So I actually wrote this into my first book. I was probably about six or seven, and I was, I, and I can still feel like the way the temperature in the room felt, the way my room felt, everything. In the dream, um, I guess it was a dream. I'm assuming. I woke up and there was a man, like bending over me, and he had like a really thick black wool cloak with a thick fur collar, and. Like, I can feel what the fur felt like and everything. And just as he was getting ready to bite me, my mom came in the room and he, like, flew out the window and was gone. Huh. So, I assu- I, I mean, the dream, like, it felt like I was awake. 
But I'm sure I had to have been asleep because, like, that's not possible. Right. Have happened. But my mom did come in the room, so I don't know. It's weird. That is weird. That's, that's you know, there's this whole cast of characters that that you know we call nighttime invaders or whatever that just people wake up and there's beings in their room. You know, right? It, it's just so weird. But uh, that's particularly creepy. And well, dream... the thing is, is I don't remember being afraid of it. It was just like, oh, yeah, there's this dude in my room and he's getting ready to bite me and then he's gone. Like, I wasn't, it was just, it happened and it was done. Yeah. Like, as an adult, I'm like, that's weird. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and dream, scared, dreaming though. in place is always, to me, that, that's always something that gets my attention, too. Like, when I'm in a dream and I wake up in my bed in the dream, you know? Yeah. That is weird. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, obviously it had to have been a dream. There's no way. Like, first of all, my bedroom window was really small. So even getting in and out of it would have been right. You know, clumsy. And I'm pretty sure my mom would have noticed if some dude was like climbing out off my bed onto the window and outside. Right. But nevertheless, it was so it was so real that my adult brain goes, maybe that did happen. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's a weird one. Maybe turn into a bat. Maybe. Hey, maybe. I don't know. I just watched the uh, the Brides of Dracula last night. So. Oh, I I need to watch that one. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. It's like the color palette is so cool in that. It's just it's. I mean, it's very you know 1960, but. Uh, Which makes it even better. Yeah, yeah. Just the whole the whole color and the and the the, the bat special effects are particularly bad, but you know they worked with what they had back then. Of course. It's like we watch Dark Shadows a lot, the TV show, and when the bat comes in, it's like clearly a rubber bat on a stick. Like, it's hilarious. Yeah. (laughs) So next on your list, you talk about seeing your door move and hearing sounds in the kitchen. Yeah, so around that same age when I had that vampire dream, I can remember just laying in my bed, and I was always afraid in that house, and I don't... There was no reason to be. Nobody else was creeped out to my knowledge, but I remember laying in my bed and watching my door slowly open. And I remember getting up and asking my, you know, assuming my mom was awake, like checking in on me and everybody was sound asleep. So, you know, you rationalize things I'm like, okay, well maybe I just, my brain made that happen or like it didn't really happen, but you think you saw something or whatever. But I know for a fact, like one time I heard like dishes, like somebody was digging in the cupboards to get like a plate or something. And I assumed my dad was awake. So I got up to go in there and there was nobody there for sure. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, like that house was like always creepy to me. And I don't, I don't really know why, as far as I know, nothing bad happened in it or whatever. And like nobody else ever had the creeps about it or anything, but I just always had the creeps in that house. Yeah. I tell a story of waking up and hearing voices several times when I was... I mean, I call it like a recurring dream, but I think I was awake every time, honestly. Yeah. I'd wake up, and I'd hear people downstairs, and they'd be talking in a language I couldn't understand. And I could just just barely hear them talking... And I knew it wasn't anybody in my family because my mom would get up with my dad and like make breakfast and stuff. You could, you know, you could hear him making breakfast. You could hear sure. my dad rattling the newspapers and mom, right. mom, you know, doing mom stuff. And it wasn't that. It was just talking. And I, it scared the bejeebus out of me. I just. Yeah, that's super creepy. I just remember being a kid, just being in bed like, like and just like, I don't want them to know I'm awake. It was, And that happened several times. I mean, I want to say. I don't know. Enough where I remember it now as a recurring dream, so maybe maybe half a dozen times, I don't know. But Yeah, over, that's really scary. Over the course of years, like over the I you know, from the point where I was like real young to I want probably 8, you know. Very strange, but uh anyway, the story <laughs> reminded me of that. Yeah, that there was definitely nothing that elaborate, but Just creep, you know, like a creepy vibe. Like sometimes I would just feel creeped out for no reason. I don't Mm. know. I mean, people are that way. So I always just explained it that I was just one of those people that get creeped out easily. 
But I don't right. think I am. So I don't know. Well, Weird. did you see this oil lamp light itself? I definitely did see that oil lamp light itself. So when my grandfather died, we went down to West Virginia for the funeral and whatever. And he collected oil lamps, like the old fashioned kind that you have to actually light, you know, with flames. And the way the room was situated was the couch was on one side of the room, TV was on the opposite wall, and he had shelves that were lining the wall with oil lamps. And everybody, you know, we were kind of just sitting there watching TV all day being, I think I was like, I was probably in, I think, eighth grade at the time. So you don't want to be there, and you're just there watching TV all day. And it was that time of day where the sun is kind of just starting to go down, so nobody has really turned on any lights in the house yet. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting there, so it's getting darker and darker and darker, and all of a sudden one of these oil lamps is, like, on. Wow. And nobody seems to think it's weird. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I'm telling my, my parents, I'm like, how did that oil lamp come on? And they're like, I don't know. You know, they're all focused on their conversations with the other adults and stuff. And I'm like, but how did it turn on? And my brother's like, what's the big deal? If, if it is, it's just grandpa. Who cares? And I'm like, oh, I care. That's yeah. weird. Yeah. It's weird for an oil lamp to light itself. And nobody seemed to think that that was odd. So I, you know, the way the room was situated, 100%, we would have seen somebody go over and light the thing. And I was sitting there all day. So. Hmm. Very weird to me, and but again, apparently I was the weirdo that thought it was weird. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a lot of weird stuff around my grandfather, though. So I was gonna say, is this the same grandfather that gave a warning to your mother? Like, it is. Like he. Um, so this is after he passed. I'm assuming. Yeah, that happened after he passed. So, he, and another thing that happened after he died, and this has happened to me with several people is I had a dream where he I was sitting in a in a room with him and it was just like a regular old white room and he came in like dressed in white and we had like a full on conversation I don't remember anything that was said and I never do whenever I have dreams about people who have died hmm. but um so that happened to me after he died and it doesn't happen to every single person that I like it didn't happen with any of my other grandparents or other people that I've been close to that have died. So that happened with him. And then when my grandmother was really ill at one point, she swore that every single day he walked through the wall. And again, he was like dressed completely in white and he just sat beside the bed beside of her, never said a word to her. And it would be the same time every day he would come and the same time every day he would leave and he would come and go the exact same way through this wall. Wow. Now, did but he... she also claimed that I was there with her sometimes. Huh. Did which he... is very Did he normally but... wear white, like in the course of... Uh, no, that? not yeah. at all. Never. He was like the classic sort of man from that era that wore like dress pants and like a button-down shirt every day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so no, a... he never... It just normal man, never wore white. Interesting detail that... When your grandmother saw him, she said he was wearing white, and when you dreamed about him. Yeah, yeah, and it's also weird that she thought I was there, too. And, like, I wasn't really that close to my grandparents, because I lived in Ohio, and they were in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, by the time I came around as far as grandkids, it was like, yeah, it's another one. Like, I would just be down there running around in the woods playing, and never really hung out much. So it wasn't like I was super close to either one of them. So that's weird. Of course, they just said my grandma was just having del like delusions or whatever because she was sick. But I'm like, hey, you don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe he did. Maybe he was there. I don't know. Right. I assume that he probably was, actually. But yeah, with my mom, she kept having dreams. Like she, I think it was like three or four nights in a row where he would just be there and tell her, you need to get a new car. And she would be like, well, no, I, I just got this car, and I like this car. And he's like, well, you need to get a new car. And then 
a couple of days later after she had like the last one of those dreams or whatever, she was driving and she blacked out while she was driving and her car went over an embankment and landed upside down in the Cuyahoga river. Ooh. And it was really crazy too, because like for, for whatever reason that day, she rolled her window down on the passenger side instead of the driver's side. And had she done it on the driver's side, the water would have rushed in. Wow. So she had enough time to sort of come out of being blacked out and like climbed herself out of the passenger side window. Wow. And like out of the river and up onto the bank and like walked up to these people's houses. So that was just kind of strange considering she had just had those dreams where my grandpa was like warning her about the car, mm -hmm. even though the car didn't wreck because the car was bad or whatever. She blacked out because of health issues, but it's just kind of a strange thing to have a dream about. And then that happened. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. My, my grandpa, I don't know if he has some kind of connection still from the other side or what, but it was kind of weird. Yeah. Was he wearing white when he warmed your mom? I actually don't know that. I should I should have asked her, but I don't I don't know that detail. Mm -hmm. All right. So what hit your truck in West Virginia? Where, I really and, don't know. And where were you? At my grandpa's house again. So uh, this would have been about ninth grade. My parents were going down there and I took two of my friends and we went down to West Virginia, and my grandparents literally lived on the top of a hill in the middle of nowhere in French Creek, West Virginia. There was no houses around like that were close enough that where you could see them at all, and they lived literally at the top of the hill, and there was like no indoor plumbing. It was like very old school. Mm -hmm. And so we were, me and my friends were going to just sleep in the back of my dad's truck and it had like a cab on and everything and we had our blankets and all that stuff in there. So that night we were in the back of the truck and something came and like pounded on the side of the truck. Hmm. And of course we freaked out and screamed and like we're assuming it's like my dad or something even though that would be some completely out of character for my dad to do something like that. Right. So we popped the back of the cab open and we like jumped out like and there was nobody there. Hmm. And I mean, I have no clue. I don't know if it was some person that lived near the, well, there was nobody that lived nearby. Right. That's the thing like they would have to come from a mile away or something. So I don't, we have no idea. And like, there was nobody up in the house at the time because like none of the lights were on in the house. So everybody was asleep. My grandparents sure as heck were not going to be doing that. My mom wouldn't have done it. And the only one I can think remotely that would do it would be my dad, but that would still be like super out of character. Mm -hmm. So we have no idea, like I have no clue what it was. Yeah, that's creepy. And I never thought anything of it. I just thought, oh, well, that was weird. Mm-hmm. You know, as you do. And it just happened once. Yeah, it just happened that one time. And then it, it's like we just kind of put it out of our mind like, oh, okay, well, that was weird. And then let it go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't deter us from sleeping out there the following night. And nothing <laughs> happened that night. So I don't know. It's just weird. And it was definitely like the sound of somebody with hands like slapping at the side of the, the truck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. Didn't hear any like running away. Didn't hear any run like nobody running up to the truck. Nobody running away from the truck. So I really I have no clue. I mean, you know, I'm not going to say it was Bigfoot, but it was Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go with that theory because it makes more sense than you know pretty much anything else. <laughs> totally I, you know, I, I am fully qualified to diagnose Bigfoot problems at this point, and, and I'm just going to go ahead and say that was Bigfoot. Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, just thankful that he was nice, and he was just playing prank. He wasn't like, you know, doing whatever. He was just being silly Bigfoot, I guess. I'm like the ancient aliens guy, but with Bigfoot. I'm, I'm, I'm... 
<laughs> you need that t-shirt. <laughs> I'm not going to say it was Bigfoot, but it was Bigfoot. I should have gotten Tara to record this because she has a puppy. Oh, that's right. She does have a puppy. If you have a puppy mm-hmm. and you need help with your puppy, you need 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy. 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy can help you with things like mouthing and biting, potty training, fear and nervousness, barking. If your puppy's chewing on furniture or shoes or other things they shouldn't be chewing on. Crate training, hyperactivity issues, leash training, and more. 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy can teach you what to do and also what not to do. You can find them at sithappens.us. Look for the 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy link at the top of the page. 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy can help you understand how your dog thinks and apply proactive training methods so you and your puppy can become perfect for each other. That's 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy. Again, you can find them at sithappens.us. Look for the 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy link at the top of the page. So that was part one of my interview with Tara. We had a long talk, so it's going to be another two-episode week for everybody. We'll make the second part of this available for everyone as a bonus episode. It'll be out in a few days. Stay tuned for part two with Tara. All right, back to the cabinet cards for our photo of the week with a very pretty young woman from Dublin. Yes, she's a fascinator in her hair. Were they called that back then? I've heard them called that, like, now in, like, steampunk culture and stuff. No, that's what they that's, were called that's then, what I they believe. were called then, yeah. And look, look what she has as a pin. Is that a violin? I think it's a violin, yeah. Maybe it's a very small bass. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't look like a bass player. Tiny cello. All photographs taken instantaneously. M. Glover, continental artist. Westmoreland Street, Dublin. Do you remember how you come across, like, how does a photo from Dublin end up in Red Lion, Pennsylvania? You buy an album on eBay of people from England and, and, and Ireland. Well, I think it was a, it. a family from Ireland that I bought for a different photo. That'll do it. Very cool. Well, this will be our photo of the week. If you go to the show notes under this episode, there should be a picture of this photo. You can click on that. It'll take you to our Etsy shop where you can buy this and previous photos of the week. Last week's photo of the week sold out right away. So get there soon if you're interested. Sometimes they sell quickly. Sometimes they sit around a while. <laughs> There's no firm equation to it. But she is very pretty, so she, she may go quickly. While you're at Etsy, you can get copies of all of my books. All of them are in stock now. So if you pre-ordered Where the Footprints End, Volume 2, all pre-orders will go out this week. And I have other copies on hand now, so you can go ahead and order that. It will ship right away. All my other books are in stock now. Apparitions, Illustrations of the Other, my art book. Etsy's the only place to get that other than Riverbend Comics. Hopefully it'll be on Amazon eventually. But right now they're not taking new publishers, they say. So for now, the only place to get it is directly from us or from Riverbend. Also on Etsy, artwork, original art, some of my music, some other photographs besides the photos of the week, prints of my artwork, all kinds of stuff, patches, and more. Go ahead and check it out. Shop name is Lost Grave, but if you type in Strange Familiars, you should see our stuff pop up. And while you're on Etsy, check out Chad's shop, Ruck Rabbit Outdoors. Check out Karmic Garden, our friends with the Flannel Man and Strange Familiars scents, and other soaps and natural products. All right, just a reminder, everybody, to check out the bonus episode for everyone. I'm finishing up my interview with Tara, and we'll be back very soon with another episode of Strange Familiars. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts, music, books, art, podcasts, and more. DarkHollerArts.com. Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. Go to StoneBreath.Bandcamp.com for more. We are on Facebook, Facebook.com slash Strange Familiars, where you can join the Strange Familiars gathering group. And we're on Instagram, at Strange Familiars.